So what inspired you to make this documentary? Well, I uh, first heard about Paul Watson quite some time ago, um, almost 20 years ago, when I was in my early 20s. I had graduated from film school, and I went traveling through Central America with a friend of mine and ended up volunteering um, for an organization called Conservation International and making a, a film for them about a community development project. And this sort of set me on a path of making a bunch of different environmental films and PSAs and different things. And that's when I first heard about Paul. Uh, he was ramming drift net fishing boats at the time. And I thought, wow, that is a radical guy. Because <laughs> uh, I'd never heard of anyone doing that before. Um, and I thought, wouldn't he make an interesting subject of a documentary? Uh, little did I know that, you know, close to 10 years later, I'd be embarking on a very long journey to do so myself. Um, but I sort of never thought about it again and, and started my career, started my company, started making different films, um, you know, both feature films and documentary and getting some traction in, in the industry. And then had a conversation with a friend of mine sort of in the early 2000s, late 1990s about Paul Watson. And he had always wanted to make a film about Paul and so had I. And we decided, well, why don't we try and sort of that set me on a course of uh, uh, contacting Paul and, and attempting to make the film about him. And was he open to the idea right away, or did you need to push him? No, he was. You know, he was busy uh, traveling around the world, but we um, met um, at Granville Island Market and sat down and had a conversation. And he said, you know, lots of people try to make films about me. There's been a, a feature film in development since the early 1980s, um, and it's never come to fruition. So good luck, but, you know, go ahead. You can try. You have my blessing. <laughs> so that uh, set me on a journey um, of trying to raise money um, because, as you can imagine, it's quite expensive to go and film Paul uh, or and film a bar aboard a ship in all these far-flung places like the Galapagos Islands or the Antarctic. So that proved to be the next challenge was raising the money. Did Paul have anything he wanted in the film, or was he hands-off? He was hands-off, and um, at various times, um, you know, he was reminded of that by the broadcasters and different financiers that he didn't have editorial control, and so, no, he, um, he never exerted any influence over what we were filming. How much time do you actually spend on the ship filming? Uh, quite a bit of time. Um, uh, various times over the years. You know, I first filmed him on the ship um, in 2003 um, when it was in dry dock in Seattle. Then in 2004, I filmed the ship on the ship going from Seattle to Vancouver. Then I met the ship in the Galapagos Islands and spent six weeks aboard the ship. Um, then um, uh, my friend Christian Olson went aboard the ship and filmed for two and a half months in the Antarctic. So, you know, we were on board for vast stretches of time. Was it ever scary for you being out there on the ship? Um, it was never scary for me, personally. I don't, for whatever reason, just never felt scared. I think, um, you know, I definitely had crew members come to me at a couple times saying, I need to get off the ship. I don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, there isn't getting off the ship. You can't get off the ship often for long periods of time once you're on board. Um, and I think um, if you've watched the film, everyone was pretty scared in the Antarctic when um, Paul was on a collision course with the Nishin Maru, which is a very large vessel, which would have literally sunk uh, the Farley Moat had they collided. So I think everyone was, yeah. And how much did you know about the whaling industry beforehand? Um, you know, I didn't know a lot. Um, to be honest, 10 years ago, I didn't know a lot about whales and certainly have learned a lot and learned a lot uh, about the history of whaling. You know, I read a lot of books and, um, you know, viewed a lot of archival footage, hundreds of hours of archival footage of uh, the early Greenpeace uh, anti-whaling voyages, which are in the film, and then all, uh, you know, the of course of events that led up to the moratorium in the 1980s against whaling. Um, so I learned a lot over the 10 years of making the film. Was there anything that really shocked you or surprised you about it? 
Yeah, I, I think the sense of vastness of the ocean, you know, we spend all this time on land and so we don't really think about it. We don't think about the oceans that much, I think. And um, I definitely got the sense being aboard the ships that, wow, the oceans are immense and there is nobody out here. Like, you can really pretty much do whatever you want at sea and nobody's going to notice is the truth. Um, I, I sort of had this naive idea that maybe there was people policing or people would follow international law or respect, you know, countries' individual laws um, when it came when it comes to fishing um, and any kind of marine regulation, but people actually really don't. Um, you know, when I was aboard the ship in the Galapagos Islands, we came across numerous fishing boats fishing within the park boundaries of the Galapagos, and that's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a marine reserve. There's very strict legislation around it, but the truth is the marine the marine reserve itself had one ship that could patrol, and that was a ship that uh, Sea Shepherd had donated, and so it was very hard to enforce the legislation. Um, so I think that was sort of the most shocking to me was that, oh, wow, there's just no enforcement at sea. How important do you think films like Eco Pirate and The Cove and Sharkwater are at getting the message out? Well, I think I, I think they're important. I mean, I think obviously there's a general increased awareness about these issues by the number of films that are being made, you know, um, about fishing, about sharks, about uh, dolphins. So obviously there's sort of a collective awareness evolving. And um, I think I really, you know, one of the most important things to me about my film is that it reaches people. And during Hot Docs, we had a screening for high school students. And that was really great, uh, you know, sitting there and and feeling their response to the film. Um, Because, you know, young people, it's a long film. I was wondering, wow, are they going to sit through this? But they were engaged in... They care profoundly about these issues in a way that I think when I was probably a teenager, I didn't know about a lot of these things. Um, I cared about animals because I grew up on a ranch and, you know, was grew up very close to animals, but I just didn't know a lot of this stuff. So I think my film is just part of sort of a larger matrix of, of media and awareness that's happening now. What do you hope people get out of the film? Well, two things. Um one of the things that really hit me uh, w- happened last year when I was out on a kayaking trip off the coast of Vancouver Island. And my sister had just passed away, and I, t- I took her sons with me on this kayaking trip. And um, so it was a time of real soul-searching and thoughtfulness and mourning. And and on this kayaking trip, we saw whales every single day feeding in this area, this park we were in, this marine park. And my husband and I got into an argument about what the whales were because I was like, oh, those are humpback whales. And he said, no, you know, I've been coming here my whole life. I've never seen humpback whales here. I've only seen gray whales. So I said, no, no, these are definitely humpback whales. I spent a lot of time looking at whale identification charts and have them up in my edit suite. And they're definitely humpback whales. So when we got back, we did a bunch of research. And it turns out that the humpback population has rebounded to an extent that you're now seeing humpbacks again in the waters off the coast of British Columbia, and you wouldn't have 10, 15 years ago. So it really just struck me that not only the work of Paul Watson, but the work of all these early Greenpeace people that you see in the film, and people like Paul Spong, and many, many people around the world, causing the moratorium on whaling actually allowed some of these whale populations to rebound, not to the levels that they were before, but come back from the brink, many of them from the brink of extinction that they were at in the 80s. Um, and that to me was profound, that that these people did change the world, did create change. And the second thing that has really struck me in interviewing many people, especially um, people who oppose Paul, is that I think people have forgotten the social function of activists because often they're mired in sort of hating Paul or disagreeing with him or being angered by what he said. um, And I think it's because we have so many rights and freedoms as humans at at this stage in our our history. You know, 100 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to vote. But if it weren't for a group of very dedicated women, suffragettes, who fought for that right, um, I wouldn't potentially have that right today, but we've sort of forgotten because we take it for granted. 
And I think that's the role that people like Paul Watson play in our society, that they're activists. Their role in society is to agitate, is to anger people, is to change perception, is to get information out there and to ultimately result in the change of legislation. And, and I think we've forgotten that. So I hope people get that from the film.